select um, panelists and attendees so that everybody can see that you are around here. Let me start by uh, introducing the speakers today. So Professor Andreas Schachner uh, is responsible for Near Eastern Archaeology at the German Archaeological Institute in Istanbul. He studied Near Eastern Archaeology, Assyriology and Oriental Studies in Cologne and in Munich. But the academic year 1890, he studied abroad and nowhere else than here in Ankara in Hacettepe University. And I think that that's at least one of the reasons for his excellent Turkish. So in 93, he was promoted, uh, he, he obtained his PhD. And from 200, 2006 onwards, he was director of the Boasco Hattusha ex excavation. So it's seen as one project, but in reality, there are several sub projects. And if I'm not mistaken, at the moment, there are, there are eight sub um, projects uh, in the overall um, uh, Hattusha excavation. So which is probably also reflecting the funding of uh, the mosaic of funding. Uh, Andreas is also an uh, extraordinary uh, professor for Near Eastern Studies at Würzburg University. And he leads there a subproject of the DF, De uh, Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft Research Unit, self, local self-governance in the context of weak statehood in antiquity and the modern era. era. Dr. Dominic Krüger, studied classical archaeology and, alt and uh, ancient history at the uh, Humboldt University in Berlin. And she too were studied in Turkey for a while, but in Mersin, uh, in the south of Turkey. She also uh, has a PhD from the Humboldt University in Berlin, and she worked uh, for her PhD, so she focused on Silesia. Uh, while she was working on her PhD, she was, she was a scientific collaborator at, uh, in the redaction at the German Archaeological Institute, and since to, uh, April 2019, She's a postdoctoral research assistant at uh, Boasco uh, in the project that I mentioned before, so the DFK project. The lecture, the title of this lecture about Assyrians, Hittites and Romans in Boasco, Hattusha, already promise, uh, promises a real treat. And I hope that many of us, many of the people we are at, attending today, have had the uh, opportunity to visit this truly wonderful excavation type, the site where German Archaeological Institute has uh, been working for long term. But today uh, we will uh, learn that in recent years, excavation in the northern lower town of Waske have provi provided fundamentally new views on the foundation of the Hittite capital and its development before it was a Hittite capital. So uh, we're going to hear about large storage buildings from the time of the Assyrian trade colonies, a large building from the early Hittite period that provides insight into ritual festivals that um, previously the excavation team and the rest of the uh, academic world and scientific world was unaware of. But in addition, also the investigation of an extensive Roman settlement in the northern subcity of the Hittite runes has played a great role in the last uh, year's um, excavations and discoveries. I think that for many of us, uh, most of this, and especially the Romans in Hattusha, are entirely new, and we are therefore also very much looking forward to learning about these new developments. So the word is your, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lutgarde. I will share my screen. And now everybody should see um, the first slide. Um, I want to say thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity here to present our recent research. And as Lutgarde mentioned, um, we will uh, focus on two of the projects running or run uh, in, in Boasco at the moment. Maybe since you, you brought this topic up, uh, I just want to, to say a word about the structure, which might be interesting for those who are dealing with archaeology professionally. 
Um, the German Archaeological Institute has, uh, has developed um, an attitude that these, um, that these large excavation sites are not only for one project or two projects, but they should actually serve as a, as a platform, as a research platform internationally in, in ideal, um, which uh, then can be used in accordance to the major large goals of the project um, by other researchers, by international researchers. And that is exactly what we are doing. We have, um, and we had projects of, of other people and we still have, and I hope also to develop uh, something more. Uh, also, we have a Tubitak uh, project as, at the moment. So um, it's in Turkish international cooperation, which is, um, accidentally led uh, by the German Archaeological Institute, but in this respect, in, in the respect of science, um, nationally does, nationality doesn't matter uh, all uh, too much. That just for for the start, and now we want to go into the details or into the into the into our topic. Um, I want to uh, speak about how. Uh, or about our recent results on the the, the early periods in Bosque, that is more or less the last five, six, seven years of excavations, uh, and at the very end we will have in a, of my talk we will have an outlook at something which is was discovered last year um, and which is new, um, which I just want to mention here. So uh, just to remember where we are, we are in the middle of, uh, or not exactly in the middle of central Anatolia, a little bit to the north at the border to the Pontus region um, in, an, in an area which is very mountainous, uh, very cold with very cold winters and dry hot summers. And uh, I just, uh, I usually, or I repeatedly use this graph uh, taken from a book by uh, Wolf-Dieter Hütteroth showing the um, harvest data of pre-industrialized agriculture. And that makes that shows you how difficult uh, or should remember how difficult uh, uh, living in this area is. Um, if you uh, travel to Bosque mostly in summer, it looks very nice and really fruitful countryside but um, that is not the case. And so it's very astonishing um, that there uh, such a large uh, entity, the largest city in central in Anatolia in the second millennium BC developed, especially against the background of the sixth to third millennium development. Here you can see one of those sub projects. We mentioned the excavations at Chamblebel Talarse, which were conducted by Ulf Schob, who is teaching at the University of Edinburgh and excavated a small uh, calculistic hamlet. Uh, existing there, there existed a few, only a few, very few houses. Uh, and um, we know now, thanks to Due, his, due to his uh, very uh, detailed research and excavations <clears throat> that sedentary settlements began already in the sixth millennium and that they more or less unchanged develop in the third millennium. We don't have the large tell sites like the big hoogs, like Kultepe, Ajem Hoog in the southern part of central area, uh, central Anatolia. And so this is more or less what this, the, this area is able to sustain until the third, late third millennium. And then the question is one of our main questions is, or at least was in the recent years, how suddenly at the end of the very, at the very end of the third or the very beginning of the second millennium BC, such an urban site um, was developed on the, on, out of nothing. And uh, that's really a, a foundation ex nihilo, which we see here in Boas Köy. Um, you see here um, the major uh, or the, the general plan, and um, as me, including me, we all thought uh, that or had the impression that do, at least during the later part of the uh, late Bronze Age, uh, this whole area was more or less densely occupied. That is what we think of a city, of this city. But uh, as a as a to, to already uh, give one of our major results, this is not the case. Now we can show that um, the, the occupation is shifting within this area very much, 
Um, we are still working about the details, but I will mention that later on again. So here you can see uh, roughly still the linear development of a, from a nucleus to uh, the large empire period. As I said, one must be, or one shall be much more critical about this uh, now. Um, but uh, we know that in the late third millennium, a city was uh, founded and I talk, I speak, I, where I address this place as a city because it's a complex settlement. It's not only large, it is made up of different types of architecture, di different types of houses um, with working areas, uh, industrial areas, etc. Especially the lower town here was occupied as well, uh, which is new to us. And that developed later into a carom of the Assyrian uh, traders who came to Anatolia in the early second millennium BC. And in contrast to what was long state of the art or, or state of our knowledge, um, which we, when we thought there's a hiatus between the Assyrian trade colonies period and the Hittite period, we will now, and you will see, uh, or we can now say that there was no hiatus, there's no break in, in, the, in this uh, tradition of settlement from uh, the Assyrian trade colonies to the Hittite uh, period. And then in the Hittite period, the city, the, the settlement was considerably changed or uh, it was refurbished furbished, and then developed first into the capital city of a late, of a great kingdom and then of an empire. So the first question is why uh, could such a large site be established? And that is mainly due to uh, geography because uh, I roughly try to, to uh, paint it on the, on the slide um, where these, red, uh, these red lines mar are marking two major routes which are crossing the mountains behind Boaskö. And these, at, at, the, at the meeting point of these crossing or uh, of, these, of these passes, of these routes, uh, the city is located and is controlling it. So um, the input of trade from the south is one of very important factor. And since a few years or a few, well, more than a decade now, we know, especially from thanks to the excavation at Kult excavations at Kultepe, that the Assyrian trade colony period is only the second peak of a much longer development, which started already in the second, early in the second half of the third millennium, when uh, uh, contacts with, uh, with between Anatolia and Mesopotamia developed. And within this context, one has to see that uh, probably this strategically located place was selected to found a city. Here you can see the, the situation within the <coughs> Assyrian trade colonies period. It is remarkable that um, this, the, this, this uh, characteristics of, con of controlling certain uh, topographically or geographically important sites is not only visible at Hatusha or at Hatush as it's called in this period, but also for example here at Büklükale or uh, an Hanaka, which is not uh, now identified probably, or even uh, at if we uh, comp uh, if we equate uh, Ankuba with Alicia Höck in this region uh, where also the, the routes are meeting. Um, remarkably, very remarkable is that we were excavating, when we were excavating in the low, northern lower town, that we were not only finding uh, remains of the uh, Karum period, but also earlier remains, as you can see here with, uh, with the red, dark red uh, uh, parts, or here it is these foundations. And um, they are within these remains, we didn't find too much pottery, but the carbon dates are pointing to the very, very early uh, uh, times of the second millennium or even the latest third millennium. And we find pine painted pottery in there, which is difficult to attribute in this uh, with, because it's very small. Um, it might be intermediate ceramics or very early painted carom uh, ware. Uh, this was this building then was replaced by a large, uh, and I enlarge it here again, by a large uh, here and here um, building of the Karum period, which is characterized 
by about 180 um, storage vessels, as you can see here, some of them in the in the picture. They are uh, comparable. They are interestingly very very uh, similar to each other. They are made from one series. Um, that is very interesting compared to the pithoi from the large temple, for example, from the Hittite period, which show very much individual traces. And among this pithoi, um, there were many other finds like ceilings, clay boule, um, copper ingots, uh, as, we, as you can see here, here, and a few cuneiform tablets. And the most important is a letter uh, written by a certain Piushti or Viushti, who is the he's mentioned as king of Hatush, and uh, the, ex, the the recipient is Hirmili of Harsana. Harsana is located somewhere south, close to Kultepe, probably. And um, the content is they speak about uh, building up a coalition against uh, an unknown or unmentioned enemy, and uh, the offer of. Ashium iron, which is important. And uh, uh, the other very important thing from a ling linguistical and cultural point of view is that Piushti is writing in Akkadian or in Assyrian, to, so to say. So not in an Ad Anatolian language, but in the language of the uh, traders. And that is one of the very few texts where we can see how the royal uh, correspondence in this period is, mentioned, is, is done. These remains fit into a picture which we had from other parts of the excavations, as well from the early parts, from the earlier times, from the 30s and the 60s, and as well as in 2009 and 2013, when we excavated also Karum period in the southern part of the lower city. And in, in, especially here in the southern part, we were able to show that we have a continuous settlement, most probably. But here in the southern part of the lower city, the trenches were very small and it was a narrow sondage, so one could never be very, um, very sure. Uh, so, but that was the, the model which we developed. And so we had already hints that um, the car, that there's no hiatus between the Karam period and the Hittite uh, settlement. And the excavations in the northern lower town now prove that this assumption was right or is right. Uh, as you can see in the upper right slide, um, the new, the, the, the building structures after the destruction of the, um, of the Karam period building by a fire, are built immediately into the pith pithoi. They are still in situ, and the, the, the structures are virtually built into it, into them. It's a very clumsy, uh, scattered architecture um, with open areas, uh, pebble paved floors, but uh, nothing very uh, substantial. Uh, but it is continuous. So um, there are four layers on top of each other. And the carbon dates also are indicating a continuous um, development. So we can say that the, um, that the historical tradition of the Anita text is not um, mirroring the archeological uh, development and that the Anita text probably reflects um, the, the, uh, the, the Hittite retrospective and the, that, is, that it is their construct of um, the foundation of the city and their dynasty. In the, <clears throat> when we turn now from the uh, Karam period to the Old Hittite period, we see that we first have an intermediate phase with this clumsy or scattered architecture, but very early on, at already at the turn of the 17th to the 16th century, so around 1600 BC, we see considerable changes. And these changes are, uh, are visible here in, the, in this large granary, down here, excavated by Jürgen Zia, in the postern wall, uh, which we all already also excavated partly, which but what was mainly excavated already in the 19, uh, 1907, um, which, which we rest, restored in, in recent years, and especially here in a large building adjacent to Kesik Kaya, which is probably a ritual building 
connected to the ancestors cult of the Hittite kings, because we see the same plan or similar plan uh, much later on uh, in buildings where we can uh, pinpoint the functional uh, use by uh, inscriptions. <clears throat> Re interestingly, there is a 200 meters or 100 meters, 200 meters wide open space within or between the Karum period and the um, and the Anatolian city or um, the city of the Anatolians, which was not built up. And it's, it, it is exactly this part of the settlement with what, which was used by the, Hitt by the early Hittite kings to build their new uh, representative uh, and prestigious architecture. That is, as I said, the Postern Wall, that is this, uh, this ritual building, and especially the temple complex. Um, you can see here uh, on the left, already in the early 2000s, Andreas Müller-Karpe suggested that the temple uh, of Hattusha, the great temple of Hattusha, should be dated much earlier than proposed by Peter Neve. Um, and uh, I will come to the dating with the next slide, but uh, here I just want to say that uh, this remarkable that the prestigious architecture, the state architecture in Hattusha in the, from the earliest stage onward is uh, or represents indigenous forms. So um, it is in there, these buildings are indicating a new independent uh, state and its ideology. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um, in recent years, or since 2014 onwards, uh, we also worked on the uh, Great Temple and um, the buildings there uh, in many respects. Uh, one aspect always was uh, restoration work, but uh, after uh, Peter Neve passed away, um, the question of publishing uh, these major structures uh, raised, raised again. And, um, uh, I started a new attempt to, to fulfill this, this aim or this goal. And um, we did a lot of uh, re-measurements and quite a lot of work also re-excavating parts of it. So um, uh, it's already partly published and I'm, I'm preparing a large book on it. Um, but one of the major um, or two of the large, most important results is that the temple was, for, uh, was probably built already in the late 17th or early 16th century. And um, that uh, it is a gathering of um, several uh, cult uh, or, or, or of, of several uh, groups of cult rooms or uh, grouped around cultic, cultic used rooms. So each of these colors, except this turquoise, which is the entrance, um, represents one um, different uh, uh, cult uh, center or cellar. Um, so the function of this temple is, although it is, is much different from the later temples, uh, although its architectural design is comparable. <clears throat> It is the same, and um, just to, to return it, and, and it is this remarkable piece of architecture that was built into this open space very early as an, as an example of the new uh, uh, Hittite state, which obviously um, uh, displays uh, its own ideology, its own uh, way of ruling with these buildings. And not only with the religious buildings, but um, with also with the second pole in the city, um, which is the Bükhalle, where later on in the, in the 14th and 13th century, the royal citadel was established or was ex part large scale excavated. Um, the earlier phases are not so clear because it's heavily overbuilt by the younger ones phases, but we can see already also here uh, typical characteristics of the later period. And this is only an example to, to mention that the change of the city from an Anatolian, normal Anatolian town into a royal city uh, whose uh, appearance is um, dictated by certain, uh, by certain ideological criteria has started uh, very early in the Hittite period. This all happened against a background of a of a comparably, comparably good climate. 
Um, so these graphs are based on uh, the delta 13 isotopes, which you get uh, through the carbon datings. And um, although it's only a median uh, line here, and it is there's methodologically one can discuss about these graphs, it is clear that here where we are in the old kingdom period, it is more humid and little cooler. So, and that makes, is one of the, the, the factors which makes the difference um, and allows the Hittites to establish um, the large uh, and large empire here in this marginal region. <clears throat> when we now return to the lower city, I want to show you uh, to the Northern part of the lower city. I want to show you how the story continues after this uh, scattered architecture um, because in, in the 16th century or even in the late uh, 17th century to say, um, the whole uh, part of this whole part of the city was refurbished and redesigned. Um, there's a major north south street with streets to the east uh, starting. Here in front of the gate, there's a large open, uh, open space. On the western part of the street, here in this area, is a large building um, which was rebuilt as, at least uh, three times. On the uh, eastern side, uh, in contrast, there's more, much more small scale architecture. The finds which you can see here on the right are all coming from the area adjacent or connected to this large uh, building. And it's very remarkable that they are concentrated there. Um, although we don't have much uh, in situ and we don't have also much uh, in, in, in complete, um, it's, the, it's remarkable that we find uh, relief ways, that we find uh, here parts of architectural um, resembling uh, vessels, etc. So. Um, it was clear very early on that this is a very important building. Also, it is very big. It is, has it's more than uh, 40 meters long, and in, in the, at least in the latest phase, uh, at nearly 30 meters wide. So it's quite a monumental structure. And um, two texts which were found adjacent or close to this building or in the rubble of this building um, point to an interpretation which uh, was put forward by O. Soysa, um, saying that this build that this building might be uh, might be the building of the guild of the cup bearers. It is an hypothesis, but there are some arguments which uh, are are uh, which have a point. One is that the building is in the text mentioned is closed is close to a gate, which is obviously here the case. And um, from this building, you have to walk uphill to the um, to reach the um, the temple of Arina, of the sun goddess. And that is also the case here. So uh, I think that this hypothesis should at least be taken into account. Um, here you see the building again. And the most important finds, um, which um, also are related to a certain cultic behavior, which is called by the Hittites as drinking the gods, is, uh, are these three um, vessels, which we found uh, in, the, in the debris. And one, this is the fist in, in, in a, in a uh, burnt layer. Um, they are all drinking vessels, one in the shape of a bull, one in the shape of a goat, goat, and one, and that is the most interesting one, in the shape of a fist. And uh, this fist is uh, pretty much comparable to the one uh, which is uh, unfortunately located in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which was uh, illegally excavated and uh, taken out of Turkey. Uh, at one point in the in, probably in the 60s or 50s or 60s but um this the fist which we found is the first example of the existence of such an of such an object and uh, now we can better understand of how these such vessels were uh, used and in which context they were used to the south of this building um here we excavated a 
not very spectacular building, but this revealed um, probably the reasons for the end of this uh, of this area, because as you can see from the from the uh, aerial view as well as from this photograph here, um, the walls are very irregular. There are like, go well running like a snake. I I used to say, and uh, the building also was full with with uh, or was covered with a more or less one meter, 1.5 meters thick rubble of stones. So um, we think, and um, we immediately thought that this might be um, traces of an earthquake destructions. Since also within the building, we had a lot of material, which is absolutely unusual for monumental Hittite architecture, where you usually do not find anything. But as you can see here on the right side, um, there was uh, pottery in situ and other finds in situ on the floors. So that was really interesting. And that brought us into mind that an earthquake might be the, the, the reason. Um, <clears throat> thanks to the pottery and especially also to the uh, carbon datings, we can also can date this, the destruction level. And the destruction is, uh, can, must be dated to the latest 15th, maybe earliest 14th century BC. And afterwards, this part of the settlement was not used again. And that brings me back to the topic uh, which I mentioned or touched on at the very beginning, that um, here we can see that a large area in the lower town was not used in the last 150, maybe 200 years of the empire period. So what we can see, we, we have to rethink the model of the city uh, in, a, in a terms of an up and down in settlement of uh, extension and regression of, uh, of decrease sometimes. And we also have to think that parts of this area were probably settled and uh, built up whereas others were laying in ruins. So, um, and this, this model and this, this well new outline still is in, in a preliminary state, uh, and, but um, we have to change our view of on, this, on the city. Um, with this earthquake theory in mind, um, we got together with uh, Erkman Sumer and uh, Mahmoud Draho from Dokuz Eli University in Izmir, who already in earlier years did uh, similar research at Ortaköy, where they could prove an, an, uh, uh, an earthquake to have happened probably in, Hittite, in the Hittite periods. And <clears throat> when we worked on the great temple, I was astonished to see cracks in the stones, in the, in the large building stones, um, which obviously could not be moved by people. So I was asking myself how these cracks could happen. And um, when uh, we discussed this with Erkman and with Mahmoud, um, we decided to do, well, geological, combined geological, archaeological research in the city. And they came up with the, uh, with the, with the map in the middle of the, of the picture, which shows that at least two or three fault lines or their branches are running straight to the city. And it is interesting to see that all the cracks in these monumental buildings are running parallel to, to, these, crack, uh, to these fault lines, more or less from northeast to southwest. So, um, and that shows clearly that at one point in history, these buildings were hit by strong, by very strong earthquakes. Um, and we can, not own, we can see these destructions, not only in the great temple in the lower town, but also at the Lion's Gate, at Temple 3, Temple 2, uh, and the uh, and Yenijekale. So at many buildings in the upper city as well. So um, at least we have a, we have a um, date of, of uh, an, an, a terminus post quem uh, after the foundation of the upper city in the 16th century. Um, the question is whether um, we can match or we, we can connect these destructions with the probable, probable earthquake in the northern lower town. That is still open and will probably not be so solved in, uh, in our research in the future. 
<clears throat> so now we can still uh, be, or we have this, this uh, development, um, which I already mentioned. And I want to now, at, at, the, at the end of my, of my session, I want to draw your attention again on Büg Kalle, which is here, which is the highest point in the city, where, um, <clears throat> as you can see here roughly, the Hittite royal uh, um, fortress or the palace was established uh, probably already in the 16th century. It was long excavated uh, ever since the first excavations by Chantre and then especially Macready um, <clears throat> were focusing on this site because there were tablets found. And um, for a long time, I thought that this place was uh, completely excavated except this area here in the first courtyard which is marked also on the plans of Neve and Bittel as, non -ex as, as not excavated. But um, unfortunate, unfortunately, um, Neve did not, uh, did not do restoration work in the northern part of the Büg Kalle. So here, and especially here in the central part, and there are many areas which are very difficult to understand at the moment for people, so we decided, to, um, to do something about it. Uh, and thanks to, to, uh, to, to sponsoring by um, the uh, Deutsche Orient, um, uh, Orient Gesellschaft, we were able to start work on building E or E, which is this one, and F, that is hopefully we can just continue this year. And um, to, uh, to do restoration here, you need to have to take the, the earth and the stones immediately on from the next corner because it's impossible to transport them uphill. So what we did is we excavated here in the background where we first thought and all my predecessors, predecessors thought that we are dealing here with um, dump hills where one, two and three is written. And, uh, but excavation now shows that these are not dump hills but that at least here at where the two is and the one was or is that there uh, the original surface of the hill is preserved uh, and that the that the small ditch here is the other remains of the so-called Macridi Graben or Macridi ditch, which he cut through the, the area. So apart from the excavations, uh, the restoration work here, which was executed in the normal manner in Hattusha, we found two levels of archaeology or, or several levels of archaeological remains. Uh, one belongs to the Hittite period here. You can see clearly see here the walls of the Hittite period. These are the foundations, the, the or the first layer of the foundations, um, where the Hittite uh, builders filled in chorak on the on the uh, partly uh, or difficult difficult terrain to level it and to to create a solid ground for the uh, for the architecture. Um, so. Interestingly, we have probably here a large building. Maybe it is a, is a it's a hall. It can be well. It can well be a columned hall, which is facilitating the transition from the courtyard here to the building E here. Um, we hope that we can continue our work here because that will uh, considerably add to the knowledge of the Hittite uh, royal citadel, especially of the dating to the dating. Because uh, so far um, we are we are stuck to what Neva said that these that these buildings are all built in the very late part of the Hittite Empire. And on top of it, we have um, remains of the later Iron Age in at least two levels. Um, and uh, remarkably is, uh, or very remarkable, remarkable is this row of rooms, which is connected to a row of room, which is coming here from the south, probably turning and continuing here. So um, that indicates that this building, which I only, took a small part of, of it now, um, which was addressed by, by Bittel as a official building, as a, he says, he speaks about a palace, 
um, obviously continued uh, to the north and then to the west. Um, parts of these walls were, al were already excavated in 1939 in summer, um, but due to the uh, breakout of the war, uh, of the Second World War, they were not documented and then they did not return to it. But uh, some of these uh, areas were not touched, as you can see here, with, even with material in situ. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we came across this part uh, very late in the season, so um, we couldn't restore the, 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 the vessels yet, but uh, I hope to show you, to be able to show you to, to you later. Uh, and this is very important because here we have untouched, we have an untouched sequence of the very end of the Iron Ages. We will see how long they take. So at the moment, um, the opinion communis is that it is some that Bosco is somehow some at some point in the fifth uh, in the fifth century is is left or is devast is 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 uh, not inhabited anymore, um, and then again in the in the Galatian in the Galatian period, so we would have a hiatus of 100, 150 of one hundred fifty to two hundred years, but um, let's wait for the datings for the carbon datings etc. And especially for the development of the material culture, I, I hope that we get here very new uh, insights. So this was a very short uh, introduction of on, on our work on the Hittites, on the Iron Age. And uh, I thank you for your interest and your attention. And now I give the word over to my colleague, Dominic Krüger, who will continue with the Roman period. I stop the sharing, yes. So Dominic, let's yeah, go. Yeah, I'm starting. So let me see. Come on. Okay. So let's take our time machine, jump some hundred years later, and see what's happening in Roman times. Set it by warlike Celtic tribes from the third century BC, Galatia, our province here, was bequested to Rome by its last ruler, Amintas, in 25 BC. It became an imperial province with Ankara as its capital and ever-changing borders. The long-standing material culture of its inhabitants and its central location within Asia Minor made Galatia an important place of recruitment for Rome's legions and an equally important military staging area. Galatia therefore found itself in a peculiar political and socio-economic situation during the late first century BC and the first century AD, which is mirrored in the local architecture. Several surveys in Hattusha's wider region have discovered proof of the existence of several settlements dating to the Roman imperial period. Noteworthy is a clustering of villages and farmsteads around the reconstructed Roman road that connected Tarvium with the north and passed about five kilometers west of Boascoe, the modern Boascoe. You can see the road on the left side in yellow. Thanks to the discovery of several milestones along the course of the road, the earliest from the reign of Nerva in the middle, it can at least partly be dated to the first century AD. Only the road's general course is known and details are still unclear. The motivation for undertaking such an extensive infrastructure project will have been based on furthering Roman military and economic interests. The construction work itself most likely fell as is common to the Roman soldiers based in the province. Some sections of the road around Boasco were secured and controlled by so-called way stations, which based on their construction at strategic locations are interpreted as small garrisons placed directly by the roadside. None have been thoroughly explored, but an analysis of the pottery found during surveys confirms that they were constructed at the same time as the road they overlooked. Clear evidence of the presence of Roman troops in these structures has, however, only been found in those located on the western slope of the Tikili Temple, in form of a Roman legionary's helmet found in their vicinity. These finds support the theory of the existence of a more permanent Roman presence, which was established as early as the first decades following the incorporation of the region into the empire. The question of where these soldiers were stationed remains unanswered, however. Since 2014, 
Extensive excavations have been taken place in the north and lower city of Hattusha, the ancient capital of the Third Empire. The results of field physical surveys commissioned some years prior, as well as the remains of a wall of Opus Cementitium visible on the surface indicated that besides the Hittite remains, Roman structures might be found in the area of the so-called New Aplicaia. A large rock with a prominent niche carved into its surface, which was thought to be part of a Byzantine chapel. In the first year, the excavations at New Aplicaia revealed the first walls of an extensive complex of Roman buildings marked on the map in blue, which seems to be connected to the already known Hellenistic Roman necropolis here in yellow. This necropolis surrounds a great temple containing over 200 graves dating from the 3rd century BC up to the 4th century AD and was mainly excavated during the late 1960s and early 1970s. Even today, each year's excavations remove more graves, which are found even in the immediate vicinity of the Roman imperial structures. Since 2014, three major building complexes have been found. One, parts of a military fortification, here in blue. Second, a large pool or water basin with an adjoining richly decorated banquet hall, in green. And third, bathing structures, in red. This picture shows the current state of the excavations on the right, with the northern area of the camp to the northwest, the pool to the southeast, and the adjoining bathing structures to the west. The plan on the left shows the various construction phases, which we have been able to identify so far. The ones in gray are the old Hittite fortification walls, which were partly extended and included into the new buildings. Of these three complexes, the fortifications are the oldest structures and may also answer the question asked above, namely, just where the Roman soldiers stationed in the area at their headquarters. Already in 2014, two walls were more closely investigated, whose cores could still partly be traced above ground. They were in parallel to each other with the southwestern, northeastern orientation and are mostly composed of Hittite building elements in secondary use. As became quickly apparent, the ashlars did not form two separate walls, but were in fact the outer faces of a single about six meter wide wall. On the basis of the still visible walls, excavated sections, geograph geophysical surveys, and topographical indicators, this wall can be traced over at least 400 meters. It forms two roughly wide right angles and continues in the direction of the modern village, where we lose the trail. Because of the dimensions of this fortification, its regular structure, and the rectangular internal spacing, we propose the interpretation of the structure as a Roman military camp. In order to test the theory, we began excavating at several key locations. We honor the corner of the fortifications, two internal rooms, and possibly the remains of a gate. With only two rooms known, we can offer little information in regards to their use or the shape or layout of the inner structure. For now, the northeastern corner and the area adjacent to the modern road are far more promising. Both the fortifications and the hypothetical gate are connected with the northern Hittite fortifications and differ markedly from the above described six meter wide wall in regards to their design and building technique. The northeastern corner seems to have been taken up by a tower, which was later rebuilt and modified. The area adjacent to the modern road could have housed the gate as is suggested by a number of finds. Especially noteworthy is the inner face of the wall, which consists of reused Hittite ashlars and can be traced over a length of 20 meters in a large room containing a significant number of architectural elements and installations. While only a relatively small number of finds has been made until now, these, as well as the results of radiocarbon analysis, date the fortifications in general to the first century AD, possibly to its first half. It remains unclear why a military Roman structure, and in this case a military camp, would have been constructed here in Boasco during the early imperial period. The building project might have been connected to the incorporation of the region into the Roman Empire in 25 BC and the wider goal of pacifying the new province. The site's strategic position is undeniable. 
The camp at Boaskoy would have been both in sight and in reach of two mountain passes to the north and the aforementioned road leading northeast, and one of its functions would surely have been securing and safeguarding both. Its location on a hillside and therefore slightly higher up than the terrain to the north must have offered Sentinels a wide-ranging view of the surrounding area. The camp could also have functioned as supply posts, with materials and provisions being distributed via the nearby road. <laughs> Since we lack historical sources concerning the region at the time, it is still unknown which and how many troops were stationed at the military structure. Its function should be viewed in light of the general situation the Romans faced in central Anatolia at the beginning of the reign, especially for the early period of Roman rule, when the province was still not entirely pacified and external enemies were not far. The existence of a Roman military camp close to a road of the imperial period and in the wider vicinity of an important crossroads can come as no particular surprise and would fit nicely into the historical context of first century AD Galatia. It is most likely that this military camp had already been abandoned and partly covered with other buildings in the second century AD. New structures, this time of Opus Sementitium, were constructed on top of the fortifications or in their immediate vicinity. Why exactly the camp was decommissioned is, again due to our lack of written sources, completely unclear, leaving us only to suppose that neither the camp nor its soldiers were of any continuing importance to the tactical and strategic situation of the region. Now, in seemingly more peaceful times, the focus shifted to the construction of civilian living spaces. In the southern eastern area, two large building complexes were erected. The complex west of the rocky outcrop of Miraculakaya consists of a large water bassin or pool measuring about 18 meters to 55 meters, which was partly incorporated into Hittite structures. In front of the niche carved into the rock face, there's a co complex system of smaller pools, water channels and walls built up to and partly into the large bassin. On the picture on the right, you can see a positive reconstruction whose most unusual element is a roofed area on the right-hand side of the niche. In this area, roof tiles, Doric capitals, and fragments of paint wall plaster have been found. One of the painted panels is a colorful floral motif has already been reconstructed. This speaks for the reconstruction of the area as a kind of banquet hall, which was separated from the pool by a portico with Doric columns. The exact function of these installations at Miraplikaya is still unclear, and the lack of contemporary comparisons makes it difficult to specify their purpose. <clears throat> but the lack of objects associated with the practice of any kind of known code allows interpretation as a purely recreational and or representative structure. These buildings are not the only structures of this kind found in this sector. The area excavated in the vicinity of the modern road also exhibit walls of opus cementitium, column bases, and fragments of painted wall plaster. Both the construction techniques and the decorations of the structure thus brings the so-called banquet hall to mind. In the northwestern corner of the large pool, we found another portico and a set of steps which led up to another building complex. This complex, situated to the west of the water bassin and its associated structures, had at first been interpreted as a villa rustica. However, the sheer number of installations shown here, some examples on the pictures, um, associated with water and water management, which were discovered in the past few years, has made us reconsider the theory. For now, the term bathing complex seems more appropriate, which may have been directly connected with the large water bassin at Miraplikaya. As can be seen on the eastern part of the area photograph, the white defensive wall with its outer facings of Hittite ashlars is clearly visible and was incorporated into the complex. The central and northern rooms form part of a large bathing facility. They consist of a number of epsilon rooms, some of which were heated via hypocaust systems, while others are in fact the remains of bathing pools. Special mention deserves the mosaic floor roughly six meters to six meters in size composed of geometrical patterns of colored bands and diamond shapes surrounding a central panel showing red, black, and blue hexagons. 
the southeastern wall of the large apsidal room in the north and some other walls west of it were built in the Opus Reticulatum technique, the use of which is extremely rare in the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire and has often been connected to a local military presence. To be noted is also the widespread use of marble decorations, which is not native to the region and must therefore have been imported. Lying on top of the mosaic, we also found a composite capital, one of which sites bears great resemblance to a capital of the Tuscan order. If this comparison was intended, however, it was executed quite poorly. The column bases of the portico connecting the large pool and the bathing complex are in fact repurposed capitals, which seem to have scrapped due to deflect of flaws, as can, for example, be seen on the picture on the bottom right. One must presume that these capitals were the work of a local artisan lacking the experience of a more skilled craftsman. These architectural features appear to be a deliberate attempt by the builders to copy contemporary Roman imperial architectural trends. While they were still largely unknown in Galatia at that time, most of them can be found not only in Rome, but also in various variants and forms in the cities of the Roman East. The mediocre, or at times even deficient workmanship, however, speaks in our case for local craftsmen who were still unpracticed in recreating these architectural forms and building techniques. Where exactly these artisans and the comparably large workforce necessary for these construction lift and who paid their wages can as often now only be speculated. In the case of the erection and maintenance of the military camp, the official imperial Roman administration may have played a greater role. The military structures were, after all, directly connected to the incorporation of Galatia into the Roman Empire, and the site was possibly of additional importance as a supply base and a garrison to guard the world. In contrast, the construction of an extravagantly furnished basin complex more likely stemmed from the building efforts of a wealthy local resident or perhaps a Roman administrator. For now, the question of the identity and function of the basin structure's owner must remain un unanswered. Its sheer size, elaborate layout and rich decor, especially in the area directly adjacent to the Rock of Nivaplikaya, as well as the current lack of specific rooms that one would expect to find in a Roman villa, would also support our interpretation of the complex as a Roman public bath. Since we still have not found any contemporary residential buildings in the vicinity, one would ask again for which clientele this bath was intended. Several possible explanations come to mind. Among these, the most likely would seem to be that either the bath was built on and by the inhabitants of a yet to be discovered nearby settlement, or that it was created and used in a kind of very unusual joint venture by the inhabitants of the surrounding area. Another possibility suggested only recently is that the bears could have been built and used by the camp's soldiers themselves. After all, we have found several modifications made to existing parts of the camp that were also executed in Opus Sementitium. This, as has been mentioned, could point to <coughs> <coughs> this, as has been mentioned, could point to the possible involvement of military forces, perhaps the stationed at the camp. In this scenario, the camp would have been used well into the second century AD and been remodeled and furnished with a bathing complex by its inhabitants. Whoever the structure's intended clients may be. Its construction made installation and maintenance of a constant water supply a necessity. A substantial number of water channels, taking the form of simple stone channels set without the aid of water, channels coated with hydraulic mortar and clay pipes have indeed been found in the north and lower town in recent years. Much earlier, the Hittites also had to solve the problem of a limited availability of natural water sources. This pre-exists the need for a regulated water supply was only reinforced by the new buildings erected in Roman imperial times. In Borasco, there were two ways of obtaining fresh water. First, there was a small river located close to the Roman structures, which, however, was not used for reasons that are still unknown. Razor, water was channeled from natural springs located up on the southeastern mountain slopes, the so-called upper city, to the northern lower city, just as the Hittites had done many centuries ago. A substantial number of these water channels has been found in recent years, while others were discovered in past excavation seasons. These, however, have usually been dated to the Byzantine period. 
this hypothesis must now at least partly be corrected. Among the recently discovered channels is a narrow canal constructed with the help of hydraulic mortar and covered with stone slabs. It strongly resembles a water channel previously interpreted as a Byzantine installation, which ran across the remains of the Western magazine of the Great Temple. Both can be seen on the right side. This strong resemblance suggests that they might have been constructed during the same time period. While the so-called Byzantine channel, channel has long been since dismantled, the newly discovered water conduit found in the vicinity of the basin structure has been carbon dated to the second century AD. The construction of the basin complex was carried out in the same period. And while further excavations are needed to link the channels to the structure, a connection seems highly likely. <coughs> <coughs> In the bathing complex itself, some isolated fragments of clay pipes and some sections of water channels have been found in various rooms and basins. We also found the in and outlets of several small water, water basins and the pool. The building materials used for their construction, for example, clay and limestone, were mostly sourced from the surrounding area. Two outstanding features, however, the aforementioned marble decoration, and the volcanic ash used to produce water-resistant water were very likely imported from upward, indicating the existence of a super-regional supply network. That such no doubt costly materials were used shows that neither time and effort nor high costs were spared during the construction of the complex. All three complexes, the presumed military camp, the bathroom structure, and the area west of Muratnikaya, were rebuilt and reconstructed more than once and were in use until the fourth century AD. On top of the fortifications of the first century AD, walls of Opus Sementitium were constructed in the second century AD, comprising several small rooms, possible storage spaces, and something else. You can see this one in red on the top left, and the green ones are the Hittite fortification wall. This is, as well as the simultaneous reconstruction and integration of the camp wall into the bathing complex, shows a clear change in the function and utilization of the military structures. Some other alterations were probably undertaken only a few decades after the construction of the bathing structure and the large water vessel. To cite a few examples, walls of Opus Cementitium cover the older Opus Reticulatum walls in some areas below in the center. Also, walls constructed of quarry stones were built on top of the mosaic floor, which both covered the expansive floor and fundamentally changed the use and layout of the room. Similar developments can be found in the northeastern corner of the camp, where new walls were inserted, forming new rooms. The many phases of reconstruction can perhaps be explained by local forces and elites who rose in prominence and began to transform the layout of the buildings according to their own needs and preferences. Once the central power's influence or interest in Boas Cave began to wane. In this context, the simple parallel and interconnected walls made of quarry stones in the western area of the baths dating to the third or fourth century AD are also noteworthy. You can see them on the below right. They form part of a relatively large and long rectangular, possibly three-oiled structure which at first glance bears some resemblance to an agricultural, commercial, or storage building. The coins found in the urban area of the ancient city, which were minted in various localities between Rome and Antioch on the Orontes, speak for a lively and frequent exchange between Boasco and the provinces of the Roman Empire. Here in the middle, you can see one of the earliest ones from the structures itself. It's a coin of uh, Emperor Nero, which we found in the military camp. This fits the small number of pottery shirts that were found among which small imported bowls appear most frequently. The pottery and brick stems and stonemasons mark that have been found, <coughs> found to uh, point to various workshops. They have not been located yet, however, thus making both local productions and imports possible. <coughs> Noteworthy are also the many glass fragments that came to light, especially in the western sector of the bathing complex. Among these are fragments of blue, green, white, and transparent glass, which belong to common as well as 
prismatic bottles, roofed vessels, and cups. The raw materials necessary for the production were imported from the Levant, Egypt, as well as the Mediterranean coastal areas and processed on site. As a surprise came the discovery of several fragments of window glass. You can see it on the below and right. It is the first time that this type of glass has been found in Galatia. When and why the Roman structures described here were abandoned remains an open question. There are, however, some indicators of a major destructive event, maybe an earthquake, which may have damaged or destroyed the building complexes and led to the subsequent abandonment. Finally, whether the erstwhile inhabitants and occupants remained in the vicinity or gave up the area entirely remains a mystery. There are several indications that there were later settlements in the surrounding area, as the discovery of about a hundred Byzantine gravestones attest. It was not until the 10th century AD, however, that a permanent settlement was once again established in Boas Cape proper when a small town was founded in the upper city. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you both very, very much. Uh, I said before you started uh, the lectures that I thought we were in for a treat and I think that uh, the both lectures proved that, uh, that I was right. We also, uh, yes, indeed, uh, we received, uh, we, people are clapping and uh, commenting that it was absolutely fabulous. There are also quite a number of questions. So I suggest that we uh, start with, uh, with the questions. Um, Thank you for the presentation. A small observation so far. Might the periods of the low, lower city, I guess, from the end of the 1930 to the uh, uh, might the periods of the low from the end of the 1930 to the 1945-48 be caused not only through natural climatic uh, reasons, but through financial disasters in the whole wild world then. I'm sorry, but I don't know. Uh, I think that that's for you, Andreas, but I have no, I don't know what uh, Oleg is referring to. Um, I mean, uh, the, the excav I don't, I didn't understand it either. <laughs> so, um, but I can as assume that um, in the excavations in the 30s, they were uh, then uh, stopped due to the um, ongoing Second World War and only resumed in the early 50s. And um, the, the part or one part of the lower town excavations, uh, the Northern part, um, which uh, that this, this, the northern part later was backfilled with uh, material from other parts of the excavations to build or to facilitate a small parking lot and the entrance um, gate for, for the site. So where you today have the parking place and um, the visitor center, this is the area roughly where um, in between 1934 and 1937. And then again in the 50s at one, in, in one area, uh, excavations were conducted. Okay, I think and hope that that answers the question. The next question is from uh, Judith Starkston and she asks, when you say buildings are in Anatolian styles, what specific aspects indicate that? And I think that you, uh, she's mentioning, uh, referring to the buildings that were built in the pre Hittite or early Hittite period. Yes, um, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the, uh, or I refer there to the monumental architecture. The interesting fact is that the dwelling architecture from the Karum period, or even from the early Bronze Age to the Karum period, to the Hittite period, doesn't change much. It, it, the, the houses get bigger, but they're, they're structural, and functional aspects do not change too much. But um, in contrast, the, the monumental architecture changes considerably. Um, in some air, in, 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 in some at some sites like Ajem, uh, Ajemhög, Kultepe, uh, and others, we know 
how monumental architecture of the Karum period looked like. And they had very much Mesopotamian-like, uh, or they are built up in a very much Syro mesopotamian like style. In contrast, the, uh, the Hittite or the, the, the early Hittite buildings are completely indigenous Anatolian. So they are completely different. So let's have a look, or when I refer, for example, to the palace, the main characteristic is that the, in the, within the palace, the, the, the various functions of a palace are separated from each other and put into several buildings, into individual buildings. And these buildings are connected by large squares uh, around which they are grouped. Um, that is something which we can see, for example, today at Topkapı Palace in Istanbul, um, but not in the Near Eastern palaces um, we know um, uh, from, from the third millennium or second millennium uh, in any part of the, the ancient Near East. Um, the, the, the temples are similar. Um, so they are structure with a large entrance gate, then a courtyard, a columned hall, and then the, the, the cellar or the, the, the holy room. Um, that is something, that is a structure which has no comparison at all in any other part of uh, the contemporary world. Um, you may say, or one may say that we do not know that how temples looked like in the early Bronze Age, that is true. But at least those examples from the middle Bronze Age, from the current period, which we know are completely different. And therefore I reach the assumption that the Hittite kings, when they established their um, kingdom also, uh, or they wanted to point out their ideological and um, and and their ideology and their power through new buildings or new building types. And of course, these new building types are reflecting complete these social new social uh, connections, social networks, and social behaviors inside these buildings. Okay, thank you. I think that answered the question. Khan Axel has several questions related to language. Language. He asks, first of all, are we now aware of the origin of the Hittites? Were they migrating from today's Ukraine steppes, or rather from today's Iran? Given the close, close grammar uh, similarity to the Slavic language, have there now been some? Has there now been some more evidence collected collected for this question for the question about their origin? And in addition, he also asked whether you could elaborate on the language that was used by the local communities. So um, whether it was rather Luwian or Hittite, uh, and whether there is any proof on the tablets that yes. uh, the, the common people were using a different language from the palace language. Um, so um, I try to, to answer both questions. Uh, it's very complex. Uh, I, I try to make it short and simple. Um, the, uh, the major and the, 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 the hypothesis accepted by the majority of uh, 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 scholars of languages and especially Indo uh, or European languages is that there was a homeland or a, or a, or a, a core area of the Indo-European languages uh, somewhere uh, north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So in this, in this step area. Um, this language, uh, it, it's debated whether we have one core uh, Indo-European language or more than one, that doesn't matter. But from this core area, uh, there were two migrations, major migrations uh, starting. One goes straight to the west through present-day Ukraine into the Balkans. And there's another one going to the south, crossing the Caucasus of one of the very few uh, crossings and probably the separation between the Iranian languages and the Anatolian Indo-European languages uh, already uh, uh, happened north of the of the Central Caucasus, so um, we know that we know from Mesopotamian texts that uh, already in the late or in the second half of the third millennium, 
Indo-European speaking people were present in Anatolia. And it seems as if from the remains or from the loan words in the uh, Mesopotamian language uh, texts, it seems to be clear that we are at already at this early point, we are dealing with several, um, with several uh, Indo-European languages as we do in the Hittite period. So in the Hittite period, when we have a lot of Hittite texts, we know that uh, there was a, a large mosaic, a linguistic mosaic in uh, central Anatolia um, of uh, Indo-European languages as well as non-Indo-European languages. Um, the Indo-European Indo languages, which of which we know um, Hittite best and um, of which we know uh, Luvian more or less good and others we only know by name or only have a, a, a geographical uh, addressing. Um, they are all older than uh, our present day um, known Indo-European languages. So they, they, they are an old, there are their own, they have, they, they have their own, um, there are their own track on their own track. So they have only rather superficial connection to other Indo-European languages, apart from certain structural uh, elements. <clears throat> uh, this, is, this is the major and the main uh, hypothesis, which is accepted uh, in, in by, by most scientists. There's a small group of scientists arguing <clears throat> that within the uh, Indo-European languages, there's not one, only one homeland, but several, and that Anatolia was one of those. And that in Anatolia, uh, ever since more or less, uh, Indo-European languages were spoken and developed. Um, this is not based on uh, linguistic evidence, but on material cultural evidence. And um, I'm very, um, I, I, I think it's very difficult to, um, to connect material culture um, with uh, long dead languages uh, in periods where we don't have any uh, written evidence for, of, of these languages. Apart from, um, <clears throat> apart from uh, the, the uh, Indo-European languages, there were also non-Indo-European languages uh, around in Anatolia, like Hattian, for example. That is the, the that is the one best known, because uh, within the Hittite texts there are so many uh, Hattian words uh, that uh, uh, some scholars were able uh, to at least partly reconstruct uh, this uh, language. Uh, although we don't have, to my knowledge, uh, a large text. Uh, corpus of this of this of these people. These are the these are the people um, which were uh, the local people before the Hittite um, Empire. Um, but to make a long story short, um, within the Hittite Empire, we have this the cuneiform Hittite as an elite language, and um, in in the in the within the population, we have uh, many or a large variety of uh, Indo-European and non-Indo-European languages spoken regionally. So I hope I got everything. <laughs> Indeed, very complex. I totally agree with you. I'm going to try and group the, the questions for Andreas first, and then afterwards uh, come to questions for you, Dominique. Uh, Murat Akar asks, uh, says, thank you for this wonderful lecture. And asks, uh, says, I would like to ask a question about the ceramic fist to Andreas. Mm. Do you think it is locally made in Atusha or nearby? I'm asking this because in, it highly resembles a type of pottery called black impressed ware at El Achana. Achana, pardon. Uh, this is a short-lived ware between circa 1550 and 1400 BC related to the Mitannian occupation at the site. Uh, thank you, Murat, for this uh, very uh, good question and the, the observation. Um, and that gives me uh, the opportunity to touch on a very uh, specific topic. Um, this pottery, uh, I cannot say whether this pottery is made in Hatusha or somewhere else, because it is of a, it, the, 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 the fabric is very rare in Bosque. It is a gray, highly polished, fine wear um, uh, with no more or less no additions. 
uh, which is only found in old Hittite period contexts. Um, uh, so the, the dating would, well, it's 16th century um, plus minus. Um, the decoration on it with these uh, impressed um, uh, circular uh, rosettes that has clearly connections to the south. It is only to be found in, in Hurrian Mitannian contexts. That is, that is uh, absolutely clear. And um, the question is where would the Hittites get the idea from to make a drinking vessel in the shape of a fist? Because that is nothing which they would um, uh, connect to their own um, uh, religious background. Their, the, the background of Hittite religion is the connection to nature. So um, when you drink a god and you would drink the, the power of a, of a, of a, um, uh, of a goat or of a, of a lion or of, um, of a deer or whatsoever, that would make sense, but of a fist. So um, this, I can only suggest that the Hittites um, adopted with this fist um, Mesopotamian ideas because this fist as a, as a, as a symbol resembles the Ubana Tarazu gesture, which is widely spread in the Syro-Mesopotamian contexts and which is um, a gesture of uh, uh, showing respect to the gods or to pray to the gods that is discussed among the philologists, but in any way, it is it is something. It's a religious gesture which is uh, executed in front of gods, uh, uh, mainly in the first millennium. But there are also examples of the second millennium. So I would think that um, the the iconographical uh, origin of this vessel and of this fist is or has to be looked for in the south. And it is the same period in which we have many or a few other details uh, in architecture, especially uh, referring to the South, such as the use of autostats, for example, um, and a few other uh, um, uh, details, which later in the, after the, the, uh, the 16th century are not uh, practiced or used anymore in the Hittite core land. So uh, such a fist is not appearing later on or, or so. So um, the idea of, of uh, it being brought from the South is, is, uh, is worth to, to think about. Fikri Kulakolu says, mm -hmm. uh, dear Andreas and Dominic, thank you very much for this very informative talk. Recently, Klug, Klughorst uh, published an article, article mentioning that the first three Hittite kings might have lived at Kultepe. Um, afterwards, Archie uh, re uh, clearly rejected this view. Actually, the article was uh, mostly about the continuity of the culture originating at Kultepe through the old Hittite kingdom period without any break. In the article, it was especially emphasized that there were no written remains dating to the period of the first three kings. Though I should say that there is nothing at Kultepe either. May I kindly ask Andreas his opinion on this issue? He then also writes, ask afterwards says, uh, in addition, in the article, it was especially emphasized that there were no written remains dating to the period of the three kings, the three first kings as Boaz Keu. Yes, this is a, a very important uh, topic, or it was very much discussed in, in, in the near past. Um, I mean, I can only speak from, from an archaeological point of view, and, uh, and uh, well, as far as I know the texts, but I'm not a text specialist. Um, the textual evidence from this large uh, Karum period building in Boasque is pointing at a, a date of uh, Karum 1b. So, uh, and the destruction of the building should be somewhere in the 1730s. So it is, would be destroyed slightly before the traditional dating of Anita. 
but that is very difficult because carbon dates, et cetera, et cetera, are, are not giving us a precise year. Um, the fact is that we have an immediate continuation, but um, whether we can speak of kings in this period is absolutely unclear. We don't have uh, any written evidence or any uh, textual uh, seals. So we don't have textual evidence or neither do we have seals from this period. Um, there is a continuum uh, in the material culture at Boaskoe, clearly visible. But um, the more I, I look at the Boaskoe or I work with the Boaskoe Karum material, the more it looks from, for me different to the Kultepe one. So um, or I, I see more the differences than the, 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 the parallels. That has to do with the fact that in previous years, um, when these materials were studied in the 60s or early 70s, um, of course, the comparisons with Kultepe were pronounced because Kultepe was the only reference. And uh, in Boaske, there was not so much. And there was, of course, no carbon datings. Or uh, yes, there were no, no carbon datings it take, took, taken into account. So um, I uh, more see a local continuum at Boasque, at least in the, on, the, on the level of the normal society or, of the, or the normal people. Um, how or, or the question when uh, the government or the ruling elite is changing, that is very difficult to say. It's even difficult to say what language this mentioned Piushti Vyushti would have spoken because um, he, he wrote old Assyrian in his text. Um, but if uh, theoretically this, this guy could have already have uh, uh, spoken, we don't know, or we don't know, we cannot know. So, um, and, the fact is, as a matter of fact, is that um, around 1650, Hattusili I first is showing up on the his scene of history as the first Hittite king establishing the dynasty. And in the years, in the 80 years before, um, there might be some princes, rulers, um, or whatsoever. Um, in the Hittite uh, tradition, they are called Labarna or Tabarna. Um, but they are nameless. So um, that is very difficult to say. And the, the reconstruction by, by Clockhurst is, as far as I understood, uh, also stressing a lot of uh, linguistical, uh, linguistic um, details, which are very difficult to evaluate without new texts on this period. So I think I would be very cautious or carefully handling these, these far reaching uh, results. Clearly, food for thought. Uh, the question of uh, Felipe Soares uh, slowly inches closer towards the Romans. Uh, but first, there is uh, a question about the Neo Assyrian Empire, which ends in 612 BCE. And he asks whether there are signs of destruction and raiding by uh, Chimerians, uh, Cimerians, and Scythians. In Bosco? No. Mm -hmm. um, that is an old theory that uh, the uh, Chimerians or Scythians or what else, what, what, whatever um, horse riding nomads one would, one would uh, say had an, had an impact on the destruction of the Iron Age cultures of central Anatolia. Um, but we don't have uh, enough uh, evidence for that. There are very few um, graves or burials of this period. Uh, so um, I would be again cautious to to um, to blame them for any destruction in Central Anatolia. Moreover, um, at least in the levels we excavated of the latest uh, Iron Age phases, now there are no traits of destruction. So these levels are definitely not burned, um, and um, so and everything is in situ. So where it where it was in in use. So um, one would prefer a, a different um, scenario. Don't ask me how this different scenario would look like because that, that is something very difficult to 
question at the moment, but I hope that we, um, when all the material is evaluated and if we can um, extend our excavations uh, this year, um, which is, uh, as you all know, due also to funding. <clears throat> uh, so if we can extend our excavations and if we get then more material, I hope to be able that to, to say more about the end of the late Iron Age and the beginning of the Galatia period, because this is very much connected to each other. Um, in this, also in this respect, I want to say that I don't, um, that, that the transition between the two periods in the, in the past were often mentioned as, as deep-rooted breaks. But when we look at the material culture um, uh, on the ground, it, there are some traits which uh, speak more for a, a continuum, even into down into the Roman period in some pottery shapes, etc. pp. So we arrived at the Roman period. Uh, Alessandro Camis asks, says, I wanted to ask Dominique further details about the very interesting st structure with a rectangular water basin attached to the rock formation. Could you kindly provide further information about it? And especially if known, when, uh, when was, it, it, was uh, it no longer in use? Thank you. So yeah, further information. Um, first of all, the um, niche into a uh, cart uh, oh, built into the rock is uh, also Roman. Um, you can see it on the on the sides um, where the material was used, and you have still the the signs of which material. And it's typical Roman and not Byzantine. That's the first thing. Um, we have a lot of nice. Um, <clears throat> Paintings. Um, we have the one with the floral motif. We also have some um, rectangular shapes, which looks like a diamond in blue, for example. We have a lot of red, blue, white, green, something else. And uh, we have uh, different kinds of um, columns. Um, we have the Dobby columns, which were uh, used mostly. But we also have some small pieces of marble Corinthian capitals. We still didn't found them, but I guess they are somewhere in the museum. Um, then um, the building, yeah, the end of the use. It's it's really complicated to to say, but I guess um, it the pool belongs to the bath building, so they are connected to each other. And we also found some, yeah, some some small walls uh, from the third and fourth century. So I guess it was uh, built over at the same time as the bath building. And um, all of the structures in the Roman area um, were not used anymore after the fourth century AD. We have nothing from the fifth. So it has to be finished at that time. But we don't know exactly why, but we guess uh, for now that it was a destructive uh, something, uh, so maybe an earthquake, because all of the walls were um, a little bit shaped in, in the same direction. They fell down in the same direction, the bubbles on the same side and so on. So it could be something like this, which destroyed all the structures or made it of no use uh, again in the fourth century AD, the latest. I find the structures uh, in Bosco, I mean, where they pretend to have plenty of water. Uh, I mean, a large pool, bath building, I mean, that's not exactly very self-evident in a, when you don't have really evidence of uh, a good uh, provision of uh, lots and lots of water. Um, so it's, it's, I find it an incredible puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> the Roman period, uh, yeah, Boasco, uh, but um, I mean, it's very interesting as well. So it's uh, also very unexpected. And talking about the Roman baths, can Axel ask whether you have compared the bath, Roman bath building with the other central uh, or East Anatolian Roman baths, for example, the one in Tukat? We tried. After we found out that it may not be a villa, but uh, a bath building, um, we took a closer look. Um, but after all, the one, for example, in, in Ankara, 
the one uh, near Yoskat, they are really, really big ones, imperial yes. ones. Um, this is just a small one with uh, parallel rooms. And they actually remind me more of the bass buildings in Lucia and Silesia. Mm -hmm. So uh, especially with all these absidial uh, building parts, uh, we have eight apses for now. And it's it's a lot, so that's that's really unusual. But it's a small one, and that's one of the reasons why we also think it maybe could be one of um, uh, a military bath, and it was included into the the military camp because they use smaller baths, especially in this uh, one, two, three rooms next to each other, and, and nothing else. So. Um, yeah, the comparison in uh, Central Anatolia is really, really complicated, but I still think that it's maybe coming with the military, um, the idea of the bath building, how it has to look, and so they are using the um, early and easy ones um, we can also see on the south coast. So, but I thought that, okay, it was established likely as a military camp in 25 BC, but that you then afterwards see that the military camp was overbuilt but uh, would you then still, and I think that Karl Axel also wants to know that, does it in your opinion remain a mili largely military or primarily military settlement? That's, uh, yeah, um, military, there, actually there's no really settlement. We just have the military <laughs> camp and the bath building. That's the problem. We don't have any houses. We don't know where the people lived. That's our main problem actually. And uh, that's the reason why we think that either the bath building was built by the people from the settlements around Boasco, which were along the road. So they just get together something, we build a bath building in this area because it's good for um, the trading area, for example, for, for all the traders. We, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. And the second theory would be that it's uh, also included in the military camp. So that the military built it itself, and uh, because we've also found some uh, Opus Dementitium structures on top of the complete military camp everywhere, so maybe they changed uh, the military camp itself. Um, if it was a military or not, we don't know. We have no inscriptions. That's the main problem. We have no houses and no inscriptions, so we actually don't know who did what over there. So just theories for now. Uh, we hopefully find something else in the next years uh, to uh, conclude what theory is the best one. Um, but for now, it's just a bath building and a military camp uh, in the middle of nowhere. Indeed. But I mean, it's very interesting, no? I mean, you're yeah. bound to find other things. Uh, absolutely. But I mean, it's very grand. Uh, just to, to have just a military camp, it's a bit too grand and too... Uh, I mean, with, uh, with the decoration and the, the frescoes and everything, it's a bit too much to be just a military camp, I would say. So, and I mean, also if you say like maybe the villages around, then the, the place should have had a uh, significance, uh, the central significance for all the villages around, no? So, well, uh, nothing yet. Let's put it in that way. It's all coming, <laughs> so. Hopefully. Indeed. And then a question from uh, Richard Hughes, uh, who asks, uh, am I correct that in this part of Anatolia, the landscape was far more wooded than at present? Is there evidence of timber buildings in any of the periods? I think, yes, you can start, I guess. Yes, I can start. Um, <laughs> yes, the, the area was much more uh, wooded and forested. <coughs> in the periods we can overlook. So back, well back into the 6th and 7th millennium BC. Um, what we can see, especially thanks to, to the project run by Ulf Schob, uh, is that the deforestation or degradation of the forests already began <coughs> with these early Calcolithic uh, settlements. They were very uh, active in um, metallurgy and uh, so uh, cutting forest. Um, but uh, the, the major deforestation took uh, uh, surely place in the Hittite uh, period. Um, the, there is no timber structure or no, no, no structures only made of wood, but um, the, uh, the Hittite 
or the Bronze Age, the early Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age, Late Bronze Age uh, way of construction is that uh, people build on top of a uh, stone foundation a structure of timber, which was then filled with mud bricks. So the mud bricks, which we find sometimes in the excavations, are the filling of a timber skeleton carrying uh, the wall itself. Um, so that probably led to a, a heavy deforestation during the Hittite period. In the Iron Age, uh, it looks different. Um, in the Iron Age, uh, they, uh, but that has also to do that because in the Iron Ages, we don't have this monumental architecture anymore. So their uh, simple mud brick architecture is enough. Um, in the Roman period, it's difficult to say at the moment, um, but I would also assume, again, a lot of timber to be used, as it is until today. So also in the, in the, um, uh, in the Byzantine period, in the Byzantine village excavated in the 80s, as well as in the modern building or the, the early modern buildings, we, which we can see in the villages, in, in our village, um, they all are uh, have this timber framework with uh, uh, mud bricks as filling. And that has to do with the fact that we are in this region at the northernmost area where you can build with uh, timber. Uh, or with, uh, pardon, <clears throat> that's the northernmost area where we can build with mud bricks. Um, further north, uh, mud bricks alone would not carry a wall, etc. So then the it slowly starts to get more timber, and in the in the in the in the northern Pontic Mountains and along the Black Sea, we have solidly timber uh, structures. Uh, so that is, we are in the, the at the southern part of the transitional uh, area. The forests today are coming back, um, and that is very interesting and very uh, promising also for the future. When I was a PhD student and uh, worked uh, in, in Sivas and we traveled through Boasque every year, I still remember that it was completely denuded. So there was no, no, no tree, no bush, no nothing. Uh, it was completely blank, the, the landscape. And since um, 20 years, maybe 15, 20, 30 years, um, due to social economic changes, due to measurements taken by the Turkish government, um, the forests are coming back. Since people leave the villages, leave the fields, um, on the one hand, goats are forbidden. So um, the, the goats are the enemy of any forestation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, unpermitted um, or it is forbidden to cut uh, wood or trees without permit. So that is <clears throat> these three uh, reasons uh, show how or are the background that against which the forests are coming back. And when you now travel to Boasque, <clears throat> it is the the, 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 the you, there are large extended forests there on, especially on the mountains, but also coming down into the lowlands. Um, and uh, it is really uh, nice to see how the forest is coming is coming back if you uh, give it time, let's say 10 to 15 years to um, to res resolve. That's that's great. I mean, with this question, we are now in uh, today uh, and uh, Nina Watson asked <coughs> whether the reconstructions that you did on the site are they whether they are uh, especially uh, meant for tourists, or uh, were there also other reasons why you uh, reconstructed the city wall, for instance? Mm. Um, at Bosco, we are um, doing three kinds of restoration reconstruction work. Um, the one is uh, the, the common restoration, you also can call it reconstruction, of the ground plans of the buildings. That is necessary because if we would leave um, the trenches open and do not restore and backfill them, uh, the architecture would be completely destroyed within five years due to the heavy 
uh, and severe weather conditions. So um, therefore we backfill the trenches and build on top of the original walls in the same techniques as the Hittites, um, we rebuilt um, or lay out the um, two-dimensional plants. That is the standard pr procedure um, what we do. Then uh, already start, and this started already with Peter Neve in this in the late 60s. Um, and is is re is, is still continuously done with uh, certain uh, uh, adjustments, but in principle it's the same. So it that allows us to also get rid of the uh, the dirt the dirt humps or the the spoil uh, humps uh, the spoiled earth, which otherwise would uh, this well would be aesthetically uh, devastating for the site. Um, on the other hand, um, we did, and that also started with Peter Neve, um, we tried to reconstruct as much as possible the monumental, uh, the monuments of art, which, are, which were preserved in the city. Peter Neve started with the king's figure or the god's figure at the king's gate, um, I continued with the um, with the lion at the lion's gate. Then, uh, after the return of the Sphinx to Boaskoe, we had the chance to also put copies of the Sphinx at their original place on Yerkappe. And latest, at uh, the latest, we were able to reconstruct at least partly reconstruct the lion's basin uh, at the at the temple. Um, these measures are um, aiming at giving the, the visitors a better impression of the Hittite appearance of the site and to make at least some of the monumental structures more understandable. And the third um, uh, uh, example, what we did is the mud brick, the reconstruction of a part of the mud brick wall at the entrance. That is probably what um, the, uh, uh, the lady is referring to. Um, this uh, was, or this has two, um, two reasons to be, be for, for which it was done. One is uh, to give the visitors an impression of the third dimension of the monumental Hittite architecture. Because, um, a lot of people are um, uh, are not very happy seeing only the two-dimensional uh, layout of the uh, of the ground plans because they cannot really reconstruct in their mind of how the upgoing structures would look like. That's something completely understandable. Um, so, uh, so uh, Jürgen Zia decided to do this experiment, um, but by doing it, uh, he uh, did it in a way to use as much of the Hittite uh, ways of construction as possible. From the plan to the outlook, this is more or less an experimental, uh, an experiment of how one would build Hittite architecture in a large scale. And as I, or I have to, as, a, as, a, as inheriting this, <laughs> this project, uh, how to preserve such a building, because this is a is a big issue um, uh, of ours. Uh, you have to imagine that we have to replaster this wall every year, uh, at least in in large parts. Not sometimes all in all, but sometimes also in, only in large parts. But there are a lot of people uh, busy for two or three months with this wall. So it is much more than only a tourist attraction. It is, it gives us a very, or it gives the visitor a very good impression of how this monumental architecture would have looked like, of how high it would have been, of how wide it would have been, um, et cetera. Of and it is, it stands on the original foundation. So it gives also an impression of where the city ends, where it starts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, it has, it is a, it, it is a two-folded uh, project, or it was a two-folded project, um, which is still ongoing in, in some respects and will, will ongo probably for uh, forever or for a very long time. 
let's hope so because I had a chance to go in in the walls uh, this this uh, this uh, summer and uh, I greatly enjoyed it. It was uh, it's rather spectacular, I think. Um, Jeffrey Edson at the very beginning of the lecture asked whether anybody could recommend a published work on the small finds from the lower city of Hattusha. Now, rather than asking that uh, the two of you are going to uh, give uh, a lot of bibliography here, <laughs> I recommend that uh, Jeffrey will, would write to either of you. Um, I mean, it's not so difficult to find an email for, address for Andreas and probably also not for Dominique online. So I don't think that uh, the speakers of tonight would have any problems with uh, you, um, Jeffrey, contacting them. And I'm sure there will be uh, an answer to your question. And yes, then last, last but not least, and I think that this illustrates uh, that uh, how well the lecture was received, is a question from Andrew Herbeck Herbe asking whether there is any way for students or volunteers to excavate <laughs> with you. Uh, and what are the steps that would be needed to take uh, part? Uh, now, this is for Turkey uh, a bit of a complicated and long, um, uh, long process. Uh, the applications for Turkish excavation for excavations in Turkey need to be in uh, more than half a year before. Uh, and maybe I can also uh, ask that you would contact uh, Andreas as director directly uh, so that, I mean, it's a, it's a per, the person um, has studied uh, Near Eastern archeology. span So, so la, that's, uh, we are going to leave it at that. I know that there are still a little bit more questions, but I think that we should uh, uh, draw a line here because uh, it's getting late. I would once again like to thank both of you very much uh, and, uh, also, once again, tell everybody, if you have the chance, go and have a look at uh, the site. Um, it is a spectacular site and uh, what is being done by the team and by the directors and the leaders of the individual uh, elements and projects in the team is, is really fantastic. So thank you very much. Uh, have a nice um, evening for those of uh, you in this part of the world uh, or good morning good day to the other people from elsewhere and please keep an eye on the website of the BIA or go to the website and fill out the form to forms to be informed on future uh, events of us thank you once again very much uh, once again and see you soon bye bye goodbye, goodbye. bye